You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 27. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gautier. Hi, everyone. Last week, I spoke with violinist and violist Michael Klotz about the legacy of Svi Zeitlin, our teacher. This one was also really dear to my heart, so I hope you had a chance to catch it. Today, I wrap up this series on the main teachers in my journey as a violinist with an interview with Northwestern University professor Gerardo Ribeiro, with whom I studied while completing my doctorate. Professor Ribeiro is the co-chair of the Department of Music Performance and the coordinator of the string program at the Biennian School of Music at Northwestern. He's enjoyed a distinguished solo and chamber music career, and he's the winner of numerous worldwide prizes, including a 2001 Presidential Excellence in Teaching Award. He's been a soloist with the Philadelphia Orchestra, Montreal Symphony, and the Berlin Radio Orchestra, among others, and he can be heard on the EMI and RCA labels. Professor Ribeiro was also artistic director of the International Institute for Chamber Music in Munich and a member of the Metamount Piano Trio. Before BNN, Professor Ribeiro taught at the Eastman School of Music, and he currently serves on the faculty of the Metamount School of Music. Mr. Ribeiro studied at the Juilliard School with Ivan Galamian and Felix Galamir. In today's episode, Professor Ribeiro talks to us about his experience studying with Ivan Galamian and Felix Galamir, how he uses mental practice, and why we must develop the awareness to truly hear our own playing and assess critically what we're doing. Professor Ribeiro is full of insights and really useful tips and also has great anecdotes for us, and I hope you enjoy our discussion. Let's go to the show. Professor Ribeiro, it's so wonderful to have you on the show today. Thank you. Professor, I studied with you here at Northwestern uh, for my doctorate, and I really feel like I learned so much from you. So it's a real pleasure to have this chance to sit down with you and talk about practice and performance and share your knowledge with my listeners. So before we dive in those topics, though, I'd love for my listeners to get to know you better. So would you please tell us a little bit about your musical journey and how you got to where you are today and how your artistic path has unfolded? Well, um, I was born in Portugal, and um, I first studied violin with my father. He was an amateur violinist, and my mom played the piano also as an amateur and I would listen to them play together at night, usual, usually very nice tunes, and um, I liked to the violin a lot, and uh, that's how I started. So my father had uh, quite a bit of time for me, so he taught me a lot of things, like how to read, math, and violin. By age four, I could do all those three things, and, and most importantly, he taught me a lot of solfege, which really helped me for all my life. So I started playing the violin at about age four and a half, five. When he saw that I had uh, you know, quite a bit of facility uh, early on on the game, I studied with the, the leading violin teacher of, uh, in Porto, Portugal. And um, I was very lucky that he studied with someone who studied with Galamian in Paris before Galamian came to America. So he had the right bow grip, the right, or whatever you want to call it, right, but he had that bow grip that I should have had uh, taken, but unfortunately I took my own uh, handhold way, uh, which made things very tough for the future when I first finally came to side with Mr. Galamian, and then I had to change that. Um, but uh, I, early on in the game, won quite a few competitions in Portugal and uh, with the help of a very fine foundation in, in Portugal called Golbenkian, I studied uh, for two years in Switzerland before I came to study at Juilliard with uh, Ivan Galamian. Those years in Switzerland were wonderful because I was playing 
just uh, now and then on the Festival Strings Lucerne, which was a great, great orchestra that recorded for Deutsche Grammophon and, in fact, for the archive part of Deutsche Grammophon, which was very prestigious. And uh, so I played in quite a few recordings uh, with the Festival Strings Lucerne. Um, actually even played a part on one of the four Vivaldi, uh, Vivaldi Four Violin Concerto. And then the great part, and I was very lucky, is that I would be on the road for like seven, eight days with people like Henrik Schering, Franceskari, Rostropovich, uh, and you name it, others, you know. So it was great because there was nothing to do during the day. So I had a lesson with Franceskati every day. So this was a wonderful thing at age 15, 16, to be able to be exposed to such a wonderful musicians. So um, when I came to New York, I felt like I was a very accomplished person until Mr. Galamin made me play open strings and uh, starting all over again, uh, which I'm very happy did. I finally got the bow grip I wanted. <laughs> and uh, my left hand was, I think, in pretty good shape. He didn't say much about it, but um, he was after me uh, with, a, with that bow grip, which um, it was very hard for about a year. It took me a year to finally get it. And, uh, and I think that's how long it takes when you really try to do something. Then I was uh, studying with Mr. Galamian for about five, six years in New York. And at the same time, I, I studied with other people. I was very happy to being able to study with Felix Galamir, who was a great, great, great musician. So he was the man that really, really made me work very hard, much more so than even Mr. Galamian, because he was a perfectionist. Every phrase had to be done just right, and at the time it was very hard to understand what you wanted. And it took me about five years after I finished studying at Juilliard, after winning quite a few competitions, to finally understand what you wanted. And then, of course, that was a, a wonderful feeling. Mm. That's a wonderful journey. I love how you were exposed so young to all of these musicians that are, you know, such legends for us right now. Yes, they were, you know, it, it, I was really very lucky because um, today we have wonderful people. We have actually more people playing the violin and better than ever. But um, I guess that tradition was so incredibly uh, influential, you know, in, in anybody's life. So I certainly feel like when I practice and when I perform, you know, all these little time spent with those people were incredible, the accumulation of knowledge, you know, from each one of them. And one particular thing I remember is in Territé, which is only two, three miles or rather two, three kilometers from Montreux in Switzerland at the Grand Hotel. That's where Mr. Franceschati gave a, a course. And uh, so we were there for about eight days and uh, every day we had to play and uh, the students were terrific from everywhere including even the, at the time the Soviet Union so we had people from all over and uh, that was my turn to play the Brahms concerto and uh, that was after I knew him about five years before uh, on those famous tours of the festival Strings Lucerne and uh, Franceschati said, you know, I, I played the Brahms first movement and he said, you know, I'm so sorry but you know, you're playing a wrong note and I said, and I, I became so red. I wish I would disappear with all those people <laughs> there. You know, how could you possibly play a wrong note on the Brahms concert after you knew that piece so well? And uh, see, this part here, can you play it again? And I did, see, it's there again. I said, what could that be? And they said, see, this E that you are playing is slightly, slightly flat, you know. That's a wrong note. So that really made me think that uh, I had to listen to every possible thing I was doing and not allowing anything to happen. So uh, there was a performance of the Brahms concerto, which I played, that I was hoping Franceschati was not coming to, but he was there. I said, uh-oh, I better play no wrong notes tonight. So I was very, uh, very, very, I made sure that that E was in tune at least, you know. So he was very pleased afterwards, but that taught me a lesson. It taught me a lesson that anything that is slightly out of tune is a wrong note. And, you know, and if you start thinking that way, then, then I think you're on the right track. Mm. That will that would teach you to listen. That's for sure. <laughs> and you mentioned Mr. Galamian before, and 
I find it hard to believe that anyone playing the violin in America has not studied with someone who either studied with Mr. Galamian or also studied, you know, all, had a teacher that studied with Mr. Galamian. He is such um, a force in the, the North American violin school. So could you please talk to us a little bit about the experience of, of studying with Mr. Galamian and what he taught you and his philosophy and maybe a little bit also about his methods? Right. Well, you know... Uh Ivan Galamian was a legend to me before I came to study with him. Uh, even in Europe, he was extremely well-known. And uh, when Isaac Stern came, whom I got to know, I played for him several times, you tell the, the, the folks in Portugal who were helping me, you know, my so-called uh, sponsors there, oh, you know, the only place to study is either at, in, in Moscow with the uh, Oistrak or Kogan at the conservatory or in America with uh, Ivan Galamian. So that's all he had to say. So, you know, Isaac Sten was a very strong personality, so everybody took his words, you know, uh, uh, very seriously. So I could not have gone to Russia. I wanted to, but I couldn't go because of political situations there with Portugal and Russia, you know, was still during the Soviet Union period. So the only option was to go to New York, which I did. And it was a sort of a drastic move coming all the way from Europe uh, a long time ago to study with uh, Mr. Galamian. But of course, I knew all about him. So many people talked to me about it and about him. He was a real legend. So when I first met him, I was uh, a bit intimidated um, because he never said anything. He barely said hello. And uh, very short, he probably spoke for one minute in 60 minutes, the other 59 minutes you had to play. So I was not sort of used to that, but I figured that um, his mere presence inspired, you know, a lot of respect. Even if you said all the wrong things, you would still be trying your very best to play your best. So I think the secret with the Galamian was that I think all of us, before we go to that lesson, A, we'll be extremely well prepared. There's not such thing as going there and not being well prepared and trying to play as well as you could. Now you really work very hard and um, you play this as carefully as you possibly could. And then basically, and, and usually at the end of a lesson, you say very little. You'd say, okay. If you said, okay, it meant it was very good. It was never, oh, you play beautifully, this is wonderful and everything. So I was used to that in Europe. That's the way in Europe things are. It's in America that they stress always the first positive, first they stress the positive things and then the negative things. But but in Europe was always the opposite. Everything was bad until, oh, by the way, this was not so bad, this, this and the <laughs> other. So I was used to that. So it didn't really bother me, but I know it bothered lots of my colleagues who are not used to this. So, um, but throughout the first year, I studied with him. I came late from Portugal the first year. I missed the, the, the beginning of Juilliard. So Mr. Galamian was so incredibly happy. He said, good, now you can practice. That's all you're going to do. You're just going to practice. So and that's what happened. I started in November. Uh, that's when I first arrived. And from November until I went to Metamont the first summer, I worked with him in about 10 concertos. So I would play the first movement for the lesson. I'm talking about the big concert. Well, Vinyavsky, maybe if you don't. And then, of course, going up the, the ladder there, I would play the first movement uh, for the lesson and perhaps half of a Bach solo sonata. And second lesson would be the second and third movements and the rest of the Bach. And the third lesson would be the whole thing, the full concerto and the full Bach. So as you can see, there was not that much time to talk. He just had to play. And, um, but I learned a lot, although I felt that at the end of one year, although I was doing a lot of, uh, of, of things, if I, if I came to think about it, he would tell me two or three things that if you really paid attention to made a big difference. But that's all you do. You'd never repeat to what, uh, what he said because you'd get upset if you don't, if you did not get it at the first first time he said it. So that so the combination of uh, having a lot of respect for him, being very well prepared, and uh, and going through a lot of repertoire, I guess, was a very very good year. 
So then, of course, it was, I was very happy to compliment his teaching with other people that uh, I saw there, like Felix Galamir, and I was very pleased that actually Mr. Galamir and Mr. Galamir were extremely good friends. And every time I had to play a sonata to go for the competition, you'd always say, go to Mr. Galamir and work with him with that. And, and he was right. He, he was much better <laughs> doing that type of the musical ideas. Mm-hmm. But about Kalamian, what I must say is that um, um, I think that what he did for you was, you know, to get your setup just right, a setup that was as natural as one possibly could could have, and with that natural feeling you could actually play your very best because you would be playing the violin the same way as you would bend your knees when you walk. You know, everything seemed to work. The flexibility was there. The direction of everything was there. Even the breathing, breathing was, was right. You'd say, you can, you breathe here and then you inhale here and then exhale slowly here. And that always worked. He was a master of bow distribution. Um, he would uh, say things to you, maybe two or three things that would actually help on the concert stage for for your entire life. Mm-hmm. Uh, as an example, you'd play the Mendelssohn Concerto third movement, where you have the the passage on the third page, I guess, when you have all those notes up bow and you have to retake your bow. Mm-hmm. You know the da pop 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 forever, and uh, you know people would of course invariably lose a little place and go to the frog. So then Galamin would say. No, no, no. You are going to stay. Not only you're going to stay in the middle, but you are going to regain. You are going to gain bowing, and you are going to finish at the tip, with the up bow strokes. You know, retaking. So, and he demanded that you did that for the lesson, almost sometimes even for the studio class. So you do that, and you'll be very pleased when you do that. And for sure, in every competition, every performance, I I don't think I saw any Galamian student student messing up that uh, that passage because they are so used to doing that. So it was very easy to remain in place to do the apostacado. Things like that, or you second moment of the Mendelssohn concerto, the very long high C, you know that you have to do seven beats there mm-hmm. so you'll be playing and of course you'll be counting silently in, in your head where you where you're being and then when you think it was five Galamin would start out loud four five six you'd add always an extra beat so you already knew that that you was going to do that and mm-hmm. sure thing every time you play the performance again I don't think there is a Galamian student that does not remember that 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 note actually possibly as one more beat. So you better mm-hmm. save your bow so that you don't run out of bow. Things like this. Yeah, he did so many things like that, that, um, that uh, if you are, uh, you know, very serious with what you are doing and you put two and two together, it really helps you, uh, you know, for, for, for your life, for your entire life. Um, and another thing he did was that when you really did a good job, uh, he would uh, say, that's it, that's all it counts. You know, nobody else matters. You are the first one that matters. You go to the concert, and if people don't like it, it's too bad for them because you did a great job and you understand what you are doing. And if you feel you did well, um, that's what it is. So he was also incredibly nice when uh, you would go to a competition and you, did, you would not win anything, you know, and uh, you'd come there and, uh, and you, you'd never say anything or said, oh, that was very good. How did you play? I said, you played very, I, I thought I played well. I said, well, that's what counts. Bravo, wonderful, this and that. On the other hand, you could go play with the Philadelphia Orchestra as I did. And you came back and you would say, oh, how was it? I said, oh, it was very good. Oh, that's good. Okay, now let's go on. So he never really complimented you when you won a big thing and he never really put you down when you did not. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, if, if you're, I guess, sensitive enough, you can see that that was a very good feeling, you know, so, and uh, a positive feeling. Felt I also found that he was a very, actually very sweet man, you know, in deep down, and he really cared for his students, even if the appearance that is that he didn't really care, but he really did. So, yeah, I enjoyed my years with him. And uh, again, complimenting that, um, that his teaching with other, other people that eventually you study with, with as well, I think it was a very good combination. And when you were saying that he would say something one time, is this that the student would then go and practice until they got it right? No, I'm talking about things like, uh, like uh, a boat distribution issue. 
if you were playing without really thinking or mm. being aware of what you were doing and you really were making a stupid mistake, it was really not smart, then you'd get very upset because you felt that the student was not really paying attention. Mm. So we are in a business that um, only the first time counts and, um, and everything has got to be done uh, right the first time and if you're going to repeat it 10 times, each time is a first time. And you should not, you know, just think because the first time was fine. Oh, I'm just going to repeat this for the sake of repeating. It's wasting your time because uh, why? Uh, you know, just wasting really time. Might as well practice something else. Or, or if you're going to practice, pay attention 10 times to make sure that, yes, each time is that way. And, uh, and then retaining that. So I think he was upset if he did not retain something that he said or something that was similar that, you should deduce that it would be that way and and you were not really uh, doing it. So uh, I think that's what it was. Mm. That's one thing that's really interesting for me to hear you say this because I really get that sense too in um, in your teaching is how, because you were saying how Mr. Galamian wants to um, really raise the awareness and I feel like that's what you do as well because you always want us to listen really well and pay attention and be very mindful of what we're doing in the moment. That's correct, yeah. You know, and uh, you learn with your mistakes, you know, and I certainly learned with my mistakes. I remember going to competitions where I felt I really played well and if I did not win first prize, I would say, oh, you know, maybe politics, maybe this, maybe that. I said, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm really, for this time, I'm really going to listen to myself. And then I'm sure that they have some good grounds there, you know, with whatever decisions they make. And, you know, I was amazed that when I did that, I actually won first prize. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I said, you know, if I did not do that uh, detailed work and listening to make sure that indeed everything was just the way I wanted, and I hope that what I wanted was correct, then the level of the performance was so much higher. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, if they don't give me the first prize this time, I'm not even going to get upset because I'm happy that I did what I wanted to do. And another thing I used to do that was not very smart was, uh, you know, before going into the stage, I'd be playing and I'd be playing. I thought everything perfectly, put a lot of energy into it. So when I would go to the stage, I still play well, but not with the same energy I had before I went to the stage. So I said, you have got to save yourself for that. For that. So the best thing is to, you know, to really prepare yourself mentally. And as long as, uh, as your fingers, you practice five, ten minutes to make sure that your fingers are warm and pr probably not even the piece that you're going to play anything, just play a scale or arpeggio, some double stops or anything to, you know, feel warmed up and then relying completely on your uh, on your mind. Mm -hmm. And of course, if uh, with the preparation for whatever you are playing, you're playing a piece that you know so well, you know, it's, it's you know, you can almost uh, close your eyes and, you know, and the car drives by itself, uh, which is not a good idea, of course. Um, you know, if you have the, mu the muscle memory for it and then playing it by ear, I mean, you can look at outside the window and see that beautiful tree you don't even know what you just played was that the Brahms I played or was that I cannot even remember mm -hmm. so that's not a good thing you know you're relying completely on your uh, muscle memory and uh, playing it by ear and uh, but on the other hand it's not good either to be incredible you know uh, being so incredibly precise with your, what you are thinking because you could actually get also confused. So the best thing is to have a good awareness of where you are, what's happening and where you're going and not to project too much ahead or think of the past. Even if something not so good happened in the past, that's past, past is past, just trying to get the performance to get better and better. And on the other hand, if you're really very nervous, the, your best way of calming your nerves is no matter how difficult it is, like you play the Sibelius Concerto and you don't make a mistake from the very beginning until the first tutti. If that happens, then you feel fine for the rest of the performance. You shouldn't feel too fine because something can happen, <laughs> but at least you're not sort of apprehensive, which could cut a little bit into the, the, the fun of the performance. This is great, you know, and I also love how you were talking that Mr. Galamion puts so much emphasis on 
not so much the result, the outside results, but more about how you played and how you think you played, this emphasis on the music itself. And I, I think that's wonderful. You know, one of the things that I really loved about your teaching, many things, and I, you know, earlier you, you talked about accumulation of knowledge, and I really feel like for me to come study with you after undergrad and master's and, and professional experience, it was such a wonderful compliment to everything and, and really push things even further. And I think that a lot of it is because you, you are so wonderful at explaining things very clearly. The explanations are so clear and it makes so much sense and you are pushing us to, to listen, as you mentioned several times, always. And what I see in your teaching philosophy is to think so much in terms of efficiency on the instrument to make things as easy as possible and, and get the more results. So for someone who's never studied with you, can you tell us in a nutshell, what do you think is a good way to practice? How should students approach practicing? Well, actually, before getting there, I just would like to mention that it is so incredibly important that you feel comfortable when you play Mm -hmm. the instrument that uh, you know your uh, left hand is placed just right you make a string crossing you 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 do what you're supposed to do you are supposed to you know uh, move your arm so that your fingers don't have the added strain of having to either extend or contract from string to string so that the curvature of your fingers are as natural as possible at the resting time um, so that um, you really feel comfortable and natural about everything. Because if you feel comfortable and natural about all these things, then you can really concentrate on the music that you are doing. I mean, I see so many wonderful students who play beautifully, but if you look at that bow grip, for instance, you know, or the left hand, or something that is not so good, I said, my, this poor person is must be working so hard to get these results, you know, because it's not natural. It's just simply difficult. You know, there are the people that make a boat change and instead of following the direction where the arm came from, they go always on a vertical uh, movement at the boat change. I mean, where does that vertical movement come from? You don't play up and down literally vertically. You come horizontally. So when you make that boat change, that, that motion that you are going to do is more a lateral one, you know, sideways than up and down. And things of that nature, things that don't make sense. You know, so if I have a student who, um, you know, comes and plays very well, but that happens, you know, I, I try to mention these things. If it's a student who comes, you know, who wants to maybe audition for Northwestern, let's say, and comes just once, you know, I say, look, I think you should be thinking about this and this and that. You do whatever you are, but I think this would make everything much more natural and easier for you. So then you get, then can concentrate on the music. And then I would suggest that cleanliness is very important. Everything has to be clean. So you just have got to listen to intonation of course has got to be good it, it, things get in trouble when the very first note is out of tune and you have to make sure that that note is in tune the, the, that famous C and the Brahms concerto obviously I was not listening to that very important that because the intonation is how you relate the last note you played with the one you are about to play and so on and um, and in, and then you know you have the student that for everything where they, wherever they go they bring a, 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 a you know a, a recording device said so why are you going around with that recording device you know very well it's not very good why are you even wasting time listening to that I don't care if it's terrible or almost there you know when you feel you know I really think everything is there then tape yourself and then see if indeed it is mm -hmm. as you think and not wasting time even with uh, that. and some people never record themselves they should you know so so I think and uh, I mean, I've been doing the teach. I did solo playing for like 10 years, and then I started teaching. And and uh, when I first started teaching, it was very hard because I couldn't understand why someone couldn't do something that obviously to me <laughs> was so was so easy. But I saw, I looked around, I saw my friends and very well-known people that actually were teaching to said, well, you know, I better 
get interested in this and try to help. I always really wanted to help people. And uh, so then I really started going down to their level and see why, you know, something was happening. Of course, ob sometimes, obviously, they were not paying attention. And in that case, I really lose my patience. I said, okay, look, <laughs> go either look for someone else or else you have got to understand what I'm saying and do something about it. I cannot do it alone. You have to help, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, but then when they are trying, then no matter how much difficulties they have, I'll be there to help them because... Why not? That's my job. And uh, I enjoy uh, sometimes uh, bringing someone who is really not very good to start with to, to a great level of playing. That's what I've been doing for so many years. And as long as uh, there is good cooperation on part of the student, I'm all there to help them and trying to, to think of maybe even new things to help them. I think that one big problem is that like I did, you know, I remember that. I said, my goodness, I practiced slowly, you know, the, I don't know, the the, the second page of the Tchaikovsky Concerto, you know, when you go, da 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 you know, and, the, and the, you practice for the intonation, and you do everything, and you know everything is fine, and actually you can play it in tune, in tempo, but it sounds like an etude. Mm -hmm. So I always felt, like I did, that many students, they pra when it is slowly, it's supposed to be boring. Mm -hmm. And just to practice intonation or this or the other, string crossing, whatever it is, which is natural, and it, one should be doing that. But what I feel is that most people don't practice the performing of a piece at a slower tempo. Mm -hmm. They only practice at a slower tempo. They never sort of perform it at a slower tempo. And one of the things that really helped me immensely is to, um, to performing the piece, whatever you're going to play, at a slower tempo. There was a time that I would be filling in for someone or playing the Tchaikovsky Concerto here or the Brahms there. or whatever. So these are pieces I played probably, I don't know, 50, 60 times with orchestras. But if you don't play them for a couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, then you better practice a little bit. I think I could still go there, pick up the violin and play it. And I don't think it would be, I think it would be good. <laughs> but, I, but I was not sure. So I would not ever go to the stage not being sure so what i would do and what i usually do i get the metronome and i start practicing the piece at a slower tempo really slow it might take me three four days to get to tempo but when i get to tempo it's ready to go to the stage and perform so four days is not so bad you know and um rather than you know trying fast and go slow and then again oh this passage is not so good let me try this so that at, on the long run you i think you lose more time so and then stopping the metronome at a given tempo that is slow and uh, do it you know with with everything in it just as if you are performing it i this has helped me so much i have tried it with quite a few students and with great success mm -hmm. so you know, most students or most of us, I, all, including myself, we when we practice, okay, practice very well. Now I'm going to play the Brahms concerto. And you think it's going to be beautiful because you practice so, so hard. And then you find it difficult to keep that good level, you know, high level of playing. And it's, I think, because you never really try to do that at a slower tempo, mm -hmm. you know bringing everything in you know the the interpretation of it with the technique the cleaning cleanliness the the intonation you name it all the things that the sound the bow distribution everything and that's what i would uh, that's what i do when we talk about mental practicing i mean i don't want to be practicing for five hours the day i have to perform in the evening mm -hmm. so i can save my my fingers my arms my body i can you know, lie down. I can even put the TV in the hotel room without sound, mm -hmm. and uh, I can be playing in my head the old concerto. And when I do that, it's not just the notes. No, it's the bowing, the fingering, the positions I am at, and so that when you go to the concert, nothing really should go wrong. Mm -hmm. It might, but usually it doesn't. You know, so, and I think that is a, a security that you have to have. Mm -hmm. And I think it's good first to try that, you know, not with a concerto, but maybe with a piece, you know, so that you can see, you know, you're going to go to the stage to play a piece. You'll be there for five minutes, ten minutes at the most. And that is a good thing. That's what I do, for instance, you know, with my students uh, when they go to Meadowmount every summer. I mean, that place is 
so incredibly difficult to perform. I was more nervous to play there than, than a soloist with the Philadelphia Orchestra. I literally was. I was scared to death the first day, the first time I had to go there and play on that stage. I thought that was a, an awful thing going to happen. You know, thinking about that date is like it was a death sentence, you know? <laughs> really was. I mean, I was obsessed with it, you know, because it had, A, you knew it had to be right, because if it was not right, all those other kids, 200, would be there. Uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, you know, it, it was that atmosphere. So, and if you would go there and you played it just right, then then you felt so good. That performance gave so much to you, then you, anywhere you'd go, you'd feel so much more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I was very comfortable when we, I played with the orchestra after playing that same thing. I uh, played Sibelius Concerto at Metamont one week before I went to play for 10,000 people with the Philadelphia Orchestra when I was 20 years old. So I actually felt m more comfortable playing with the orchestra than at Metamont. I mean, it's <laughs> ridiculous, but that's the way it was. So my students now at Metamont, I feel that they are very scared. I know that. They don't say sometimes, but they come to me, oh, performance is tomorrow, you know, and they say, okay, you'll be fine. Just go there, do the best you can, you know? And uh, so if it is a first year student, first summer student, I never really put them there to play a concerto mm -hmm. or a long piece. If they are really novices at this, you know, and are not very experienced, I would put them playing maybe for about 12, 15 minutes where they can play two pieces, they can play a, a slow piece and then something challenging. And uh, once they do that, they are ready next summer to play a full concerto mm -hmm. because the, the, the ice was broken. They are really into it and uh, they have everything that, uh, they, and then they know all how these things we just talked about, how to practice, what they have to do in order to go there and not be so scared. That's the, the only way they can face the performance is to be incredibly well prepared. Right. And if something goes wrong, then it goes wrong. Nobody's going to... You know, I always say this story. When I was about six or seven years old, I went to the to my little town's circus. You know, the circuses used to go from town mm -hmm. to town. And then in the trapeze, you'd see those people going back and forth, you know, making acrobatics there. And then you have to time very well how would you jump from one place to the other so you could hold on to someone's feet or hands, whatever it was. Because if you didn't, you'd die because there was no safety net <laughs> underneath. And when I saw that, my goodness. Uh, or in the circus, the, the circle that goes around with someone there and they throw knives and it goes, you know, without touching those people. I mean, this is ridiculous. I told my students, look, at least if you miss, you're not, you, want, you will not die. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but other than that, you should feel like you would be at, on the circus. And the, you cannot miss. You just have to do everything you possibly can not to miss. Mm -hmm. Yes. There's so many great things in what you said, as always. It's so true that sometimes we practice slowly, but without the emotion, we're not thinking of the sound, and then it doesn't translate as well in tempo, that's for sure. And one thing you mentioned, and that I feel you are so great at, is mental practice. And that's difficult. Mental practice is not an easy thing to do. When you practice mentally, in your case, do you do it with the score or is this something that you do by memory? And do you feel, or maybe a better way to approach this is if someone has never mentally practiced, how would you recommend they go about it? I think they should, uh, you know, just uh, mental, uh, do the mental practicing on a, a short piece, you know, maybe just one page mm -hmm. and know exactly what is there. Uh, and then from there going fast, uh, going to a more substantial, you know, uh, piece and so on. I would mental practice as slowly as necessary, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, not it, that's not so good for your mind. But what else can you do? <laughs> you you're, you have to train your mind to digest things, and then your mind will then do the rest, you know, later on. And uh, so if I'm going to be playing the Tchaikovsky concerto that evening or something, I said, you know, I have, I have nothing to do. I'm in the hotel room, you know, might as well let me play this whole thing in my head, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and I said, oh, I'm, I, I'm a little lazy. I don't feel like uh, do a thing in tempo. I know, I, I don't think, even if I'm lazy, I'm going to do it right in tempo, and I better not miss a thing. Mm -hmm. So, and then I... I uh, then I play it in tempo in my head uh, with my mind always a fraction of a second ahead of where I am. 
mm-hmm. and uh, and depending of course on the speed uh, you know maybe a bit further ahead than uh, on a faster tempo than a slower tempo and the whole idea is to know exactly what am I going to do that evening everything will be there mm-hmm. and if you do this invariably you go to the performance and you are not as nervous mm-hmm. because you have that mind there that is helping you. But as I said before, you cannot overdo it because if you overdo it, you can start really doubting yourself or uh, uh, guessing yourself. And then, oh my goodness, what's the next note coming? So when that happens to me, so I'm thinking too much. Let the, my, mes- my muscle memories take over for a bit and uh, let me relax about it. And then, but usually when things go very well from the beginning then the rest usually is correct you know i do a lot of that work on a like i remember playing things like kammer concert and uh, things of that nature you know or the bear concerto things that you don't play all the time but now and then in your career they ask you to play that and you play it for the first time and invariably it's a good orchestra it's not just you know in the old way it's not a small performance by any means uh, like the Bear Concerto, you know, I learned it very quickly because I had to substitute someone to play it. And I used the music because I could not memorize that. Not not when I was 48 years old. Mm-hmm. I was not going to memorize that to play. What's the sense? If I can go there and I can really play it very well with the music, why not doing that? Because with my students, I said, look, when I was your age, I played everything by memory. Mm-hmm. And you should, because when you play by memory, A, you know everything very well, and the way you listen to yourself is different than if you're looking at the music. You know, you must lose something when you're looking at the music. But at my age, I felt like I could look at the music and still listen to myself. I made myself do that. You know, so I thought, and I still think, that the performance really did not lose much because I was looking at the music. Maybe a little bit. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But, um, but the point is I did not know that, uh, that uh, the bear concert, but I memorized it anyway. So what I would do is I would be going in on a transatlantic flight or something like that, and this is answering your question from before, if you have the score or if you don't have the score. Uh, or your part, at least, you know, I certainly could not memorize the full score of the Bear Concerto, <laughs> but the, the solo part I could, and I knew exactly where the orchestra was, so I would know what what to do, but not to the utmost detail, like the conductor probably should, no. Um, but what I always did was having the music on my, my hand mm-hmm. and hopefully never open it. Mm-hmm. And if there is something I did not know, I would be still very stubbornly trying to figure out what it was. And then after maybe a minute, if I couldn't, I say, I give up. I really can't. <laughs> then I would open the music and I would go, oh, there it is. Oh, I never forgot that. That's it. That, yeah. then I, so if I only had three or four times I had opened the music, that was not so bad. <laughs> because process of elimination, then right. that would be the the easiest and most uh, efficient way, I guess, to learn things. But as you learn things quickly, you forget them quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, I never forget 1975 at the Sibelius competition in Finland. I went to the competition and I did not win anything. But I got the prize for the contemporary work. Mm -hmm. So I had to play for the BBC about four days before that. And that was a very important program. It was one of those 35-minute programs, played Chrysler Recitative on Scherzo, Paganini Caprice, this and the other. So I was very busy with that. And I was ready for the Sibelius competition, except for that piece that I did not know. And uh, I have that piece here. I can show it to you. (laughs) And uh, so I literally finished the broadcast there for BBC in London at, uh, I think it was 8.30 or so in the evening. And then I just went to my hotel room in London because my the flight to Finland was the following morning. And uh, I said, okay, that's it. I, I, you know, I was young. So, you know, if I didn't sleep all night, it was not the end of the world. I, you know, I, I, I used to do that. And it didn't <laughs> sort of um, bother me that much, you know, not like today, of course. So I decided, okay, that's it. So I asked the, the person downstairs, okay, can I have a room where I can practice? And say, oh, sure, you can go, whatever. So I went there and I practiced all night that piece. I really practiced that piece. And then on the next day, three hours, four hours, that took to get to Helsinki. I was looking at the music and mem- trying to memorize everything. So the minute I got to the very nice people I was staying with, 
I went there and I practiced. I practiced that piece. I pra- that's all I practiced. I didn't practice all the other things that I knew very well, you know, Tartini Devils, Trill Sonata, and Sibelius mm-hmm. Concerto, obviously, and all those things. So that's all I did. I practiced that piece because it would be, I had to play it. What I was I going to do would be a scandal if I wouldn't play that piece, you know. Mm-hmm. I memorized that piece, and uh, when I was supposed to play it, about uh, five minutes before I was about to play it, so I told the people there that were calling the candidates to go to say, please, don't call me until about two minutes before I go to that stage. Can you please do that? And then he said, okay. So I practiced that piece. I could actually play it all the way through, you know, just barely, but I could. So, okay. And he said, oh, it's time. Oh, okay. And I was going, I was still playing on the corridor as I was going to the thing. So I just stopped a little bit to get in and went there, play the piece, and I actually won the prize mm-hmm. for the piece. So then they wanted me to stay to play that piece for uh, for the finals. How in the world could I play that piece for the finals? As I learned it, you know, the next day, I didn't even know it started. Mm-hmm. You know, because so, it was so quick. that was a real uh, muscle memory, playing it by ear type of thing. I did not have time, you know, to, um, to analyze anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, just went there. I was lucky that I was able to play it. I guess so well that they gave me the prize. I mean, mm-hmm. that I would be very happy if they didn't give me the prize because then I'd be done with it. <laughs> but then uh, I, I told them, I'm sorry, I'm not going to stay for the, for the finals because I just did not want to go through all that again. I still had another three days to, to prepare it, but that's just to show what, you, what we all can do. It's just an amazing thing what we can do, things that we don't even know. Mm-hmm. I think we probably are uh, operating at maybe 35, 40% of what we actually can do. Mm-hmm. That's what I tell my students, some, some of them, you know, I think you are operating at 5% of what you can do. <laughs> just think about it, do something, and then you'll see, you'll be able to do so much more. Yeah, and, and um, I feel like some people, and I'll include myself in the pack, but I find my mental practice is actually exhausting, and it's so easy to skip it because we we feel like we're accomplishing so much more if we're playing, 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 and we skip this really important tool, which is mental practice. I find it very exhausting. It's taxing for the brain, and I think that we don't like to have our brain <laughs> so active, but... What I tell the students, I I hope that I get wiser with time. So now I try to actually understand what I'm doing when I'm practicing. But it's like having several set of spare keys. So the muscle memory is one. And then understanding what you're doing, what's on the page is also another set of keys. So that if you... If you're on stage and your muscle memory goes, your brain is right in the moment. The, you know, your brain knows where you are and can jump in. Or the opposite, if you're, if you're having a memory lapse, to have the muscle memory take over and just keep going. But I feel like sometimes we neglect to have the whole spectrum, the whole picture, both muscle and mental. Yeah, you know, I think that um, also, as, you, as I mentioned before, and then you commented on my having all these wonderful uh, contacts with all these wonderful people you know i mean i saw francescari having a memory slip i saw grumio grumio also was one of the people that played with us he played the Haydn c major concerto which was one of my favorites he has the most beautiful recording of the Haydn c major concerto and can you believe that he actually had a memory slip slip on the second movement on a beautiful line thinking he just he really was going there for like three measures all over the place and then he found found this way and he played uh but then on the other hand you have someone like Eric Schering that man never made a mistake you know and that's part of this all business of practicing because I got to know him pretty well since I knew him since since I was nine years old mm-hmm. because you know you in Portugal was very good because I had lots of friends that when someone came, oh, by the way, we have so-and-so that you should listen to, blah, blah, blah. So I was always very lucky to play for all these people. And the only reason is because they they would come there and the, the people inviting them knew them very well. And that's how I got to know them. And then I really maintained contact and it was no problem. But with Eric Sharing, I really followed his career quite closely. And so what he did before he went to the stage, what, what you, you know, his way of thinking and everything, and he never really missed anything. So performances that are memorable, for, for, for instance, are really performances that I heard when I was about 15, 16 years old. And these are the ones that I can really remember. 
I lived in New York for so long. I heard Oistrakh and so many people, but I never forget when Eric Schering played the Beethoven concerto in Lucerne, Switzerland, mm-hmm. at the music festival there. And I can say that it was perfect. It was like he was in his living room and playing without making a mistake or his recording. It was the same thing as the recording. It was perfect. So I always thought, even at that age, my goodness, how is that possible, you know, to go there and play so incredible? I mean, not one note out of tune, not a scratch, no, nothing. You know, the everything so poised, you know, he never moved. That's another thing. People these days, they all move because they think it's part of the show. And I always tell them, you know, when you move, you don't, you know, brusquely, especially mm-hmm. if you if you move suddenly during that particular thing, you you really don't hear yourself. You lost, you lost, you lose track of what you do. And physically, if you do something drast, uh, brusquely, it can really interfere with your playing, mm-hmm. because there are lots of people that that do a lot of moving because they like it or whatever, and yet they play well. Why? Because when they move, everything that is involved, like the upper torso, it's all proportionally related. So, you know, the the right arm doesn't get out of track with the left because you move. Now, when you move, you make sure that those two things are still, Mm -hmm. and that's why it sounds pretty good, you know. But on the old days, I mean, I have never saw Leonid Kogan move at all or sharing in the performance. Even Stern didn't move that. And nobody really moved that much. This is a, something of today, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, or or Isaac Stern in his really good days playing the Bartok concerto with Scholte, also in Lucerne. I was 16 years old. It was perfect. And uh, so how can these people play like this, you know? So it was a that's something that I, I couldn't, you know. That's why I think I did. Many people say it did, but I know I didn't. But it, this is what really, I think, made me think well. And especially when I started teaching, I said, wait a minute, I learned a lot from teaching. I said, mm-hmm. these people are playing really, not really good. It's, it's so so many little things. How in the world can they not hear this? You know, I know they're small things, but you should be able to hear. But they, they're they not used to it, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so I think with the practicing, even before mental practicing, is very important to, you know, clean up everything to a point where, you know, that, and, and being aware of that. You don't need a tape recorder to uh, to see if it's that good or that bad, you know. Mm-hmm. And another thing that helps a lot is when you uh, start make, making CDs. That's the ultimate thing. You know, you learn something and you learn a lot then, you know, all these things that you already knew. When you go there, then, oh my goodness, I'm not even doing what, you know, nearly what I should be doing. Mm-hmm. Because you make like four takes, and each take should be acceptable. But there is one that is special, you know, that note or that little phrase. And then, of course, that's the one you're going to to uh, to choose. But if you make quite a few CDs, I made like 10 or, seven, 10 or 11 CDs of different concerti, then you're really going to uh, even learn how to practice even better. Then you have to be really efficient. You know, you mm-hmm. cannot just you know, waste your time and everybody's time when you are taking all the, making all those takes. Yeah, all comes to how well you're paying attention, right? Absolutely. Professor, I'd like to keep you here all day, but I know you have quite a a big studio and many lessons to teach later today. So can we do a round of rapid fire questions before I let you go? Sure. So we talked a lot about playing and practicing, but what is one or more other skills that you think students today should acquire in addition to learn how to play their instruments? Well, for us, string players. There is no question about that oral skills will be the most important thing. You know, and that's, I'm so upset that I missed the Heifetz uh, summer courses that he had in California. Mm-hmm. I was going to go and then I couldn't because I had a concert and things did not happen. And you know what he did? He had people coming there. As we all know, he was a very eccentric man, but of course it would have been terrific to play for him and see what he had to say. And right there, all you did was practicing, performing, and oral skills. Mm. You know, solfege, ear training, sight singing. And this is so important to us. I, I can see that there are so many students that are at leading institutions, you know, and that really cannot count and they cannot hear. And, and good players, you know, and it's amazing to me. I said, are you doing okay in our, our skills? Oh, I have A's. Well, only A's all the time. How could that be? I said, go to that. I don't know how they do it these days, but going go to that... Uh, 
uh, listening lab and uh, uh, drill and drill and drill, you know, intervals, sing them before you hear what the real thing is, you know, what the interval is, and, and really try to really get into that because it would be such a plus, you know, for string players to be more aware of rhythm and intonation. Oral skills, that's a great one. You've mentioned several performances so far, but is there one in particular that stayed with you throughout the years? Well, those old performances, I think, will stay with me until forever. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the Beethoven with the sharing and the artistry, you know, Isaac Stern at the artistry. But uh, those two performances, they were, were terrific. It's something I never, I'll never, i never forget. I'll never forget. How about, um, how about a favorite tool in the practice room? Mirror and metronome. Mirror and metronome. Those are excellent, excellent ones. How about a favorite book that you would like to recommend? Well, I guess there are quite a few possibilities. I, I like to read a, a lot about, uh, you know, uh, biographies because I think it is... I mean, from the from the people, you know, composers that you are playing at the moment, you know, I think you can get so much from, you know, very elaborate ones, not mm -hmm. just one page, you know, to see what they did or and uh, and the influences and listen to other music that. Uh, so if it's a musical thing, uh, I mean, a, a book based on music for what we do, uh, I think Flesh is a beautiful book to read to. And Galamian is very concise. I mm -hmm. like it because of that. You know, the attention span these days is so short <laughs> that uh, I tell my students, you know, I'm sick and tired of telling you how to do this stroke on the spiccato. It's pretty much like it says on the Galamian book. The good thing is, you know, the, the, the columns there are about three inches mm -hmm. wide and it's maybe four inches long. So you can read that in 20 seconds. Yes. And if you read that, maybe it will st maybe you'll understand what I'm trying to tell you, you know, and uh, and uh, and read it slowly, you know, and read it three or four times, you know. <laughs> and usually it helps, you know. I like that book because of its practicality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it uh, it really it really explains and you know in that book that's the only book if you read, if you see where he catalogs all the Boeings that you see. And he used to say that all the time, you know, he was in Paris and he was with Lucien Capet, you know, the famous French pedagogue, and they were together, they worked together, and Galamian got all these things that he have, that he brought here in with Michael Rabin, Perlman, Zuckerman, and all these, you know, all those from Lucien Capet. Mm -hmm. Everything is Lucien Capet. You'd go to him, you, you'd, at least once a month, you'd speak of Lucien Capet. I, I really strongly tell my students to go there and say, of course, they never do, but uh, th it, they should. And uh, I should make a, a print of that and put it on the stand. <laughs> try to right. do this poem, try to do that poem. It's very interesting. It can bring a lot of variety to the, to the piece. I agree with you too. This book, I, I've read it at least three times, but I could use a few more reads. Every time I revisit it, I look at notes that I took and I think, oh, I, I forgot about that. I you should, know, I, I, never, I never read that book from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And I think I read it all because <laughs> I need to go here, I need to go there, but I never really read it. So there, are, there might be some things there that I never read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? yeah. um, Professor, how about a piece of advice that was given to you and that you would like to pass on to the listeners? I think what I would say is to, as you sing, and when you sing, most likely you are going to do everything naturally if you know what you are doing, right? So if mm -hmm. you sing and you do something naturally, you are thinking maybe of maybe one or two things. To do the same thing when you play the violin, you have to be able to, you probably have to think about 20 things to mm -hmm. get the same thing because everything is. So I think the piece of advice was, I think it was the, the concert master of the Concert Cabal Orchestra about 20 years before, where uh, he, he, he was one of the judges at some international competition, and then we had all these uh, big reception afterwards, and I happened to be sitting next to him. So he came to me and he said, do you know that you play out of tune? And I said, you know, I, I won a prize on everything. You know, in the competition, he said, really? I said, I was stunned. Nobody ever told me that. Yeah, you know, it's so tiny but you know when you when you um play uh, uh you know 
at some point when you play a note, the note is slightly off, and then you you play in tune the rest by that note that was slightly off. And I mean, of course, you know, the dinner and the reception and whatever they had, I didn't care for. I certainly was not even, you know, happy with my price or the reception or the nice food and all that because I was thinking, why? That's a new one. Imagine <laughs> someone telling me that I'm playing out of tune. You know, I remember that from Franciscati. I said, again, you know. So it was so tiny. But I, and then he came to Northwestern to give a master class, not at my invitation, someone else. Uh, invited him here and um, so I told him do you remember about 12 20, 13 years ago you told me that I played out of tune after the nuts and he said oh I did oh I'm so terribly sorry he said no no I'm very happy that you said that because I really uh, recorded myself and I really was you know just a, 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 a concert that I played prior to our to her telling me that. So, and uh, I think it was the Sibelius Concerto. And I literally spent hours and hours and hours looking for what he was telling me if it made sense. And I think I, I, I noticed something. Mm -hmm. So I really think I noticed something. And, you know, if he said that, it must have been true, but he's, nobody ever told me that. Mm -hmm. So, and um, so I said, may I play something for you? <laughs> yeah. And then he said, Oh, sure, I'll be happy. So I play for them. So do you notice anything now? No, now it's just right. <laughs> you know. But, you know, I lived with that for 12 years until it came. See, these are the things, you know, the best advice is if someone tells you something, you don't don't say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or, you know, this and that. Really verifying it, you know, and mm. always making sure. So I never really forgot that. So probably that was the best piece of advice, you mm -hmm. know. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really shaped a lot of your work oh, following yeah. it. How about a quick actionable tip that listeners can implement today in their musical lives? They really should tape themselves mm -hmm. to see indeed what might be wrong there, you know. And uh, one thing that happens, you know, is like, you know, when they play Bach fugues, you mm -hmm. know, invariably is always a problem there and a piece of advice to do. And either they crunch that those chords too much or maybe not enough, depending how they want to play Bach. Of course, these days, anything is possible, you know, and <laughs> you have to sort of accept how people feel. And as long as it is well done, then it's fine. But um, I think that listening is very important so that, uh, uh, I mean, the, what I did is Mr. Galamian was very upset. Well, he was telling me, you know, that Bach field is never that good. You mm -hmm. know, that's all he had to tell me. I mean, he, that coming from Galamian means it's terrible. I mean, you better do something about it. So I said, what else can I do? I still had my old bow grip that I was trying to fix. I'm sure that was part of it. So I went to my room, you know, from the, from the lesson. I said, what am I going to do? I don't know what else to do. I'm really doing everything the way I think it sounds to me, sounds good and everything. So what I did, you know, that was, these were many years ago. I had this tape recorder that weighs something like 30 pounds. You know, those days they, you know, what you put in a little pocket today was 30 pounds then. And all I did is I put the, the recording button uh, on it. I didn't tape myself. I just put the recording button and I played the chord to, 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 to check it out. And I put there the needle could not go to the red level. You know, otherwise mm -hmm. I'd be crunching, you know, the chord. Because he, yeah. he said I was crunching the chord all the time. So, and I said, okay, and I played, I knew that needle. I knew exactly what I was, so the needle, the most would have been that. So then I played the fugue looking at that needle from the beginning to the end. So it was, you know, pianissimo, piano, so whatever the dynamic range, and I knew exactly where the, that needle would be. Oh, here I want this, I want that there. And I look at that needle as I played, and I could notice that my arm was really different, you mm -hmm. know. And actually, I could see that it sounded much better. That needle never went to the red, <laughs> to the red thing, because it almost did, but it never did, not once, you know. So I went to Mr. Galamin for that, saying, that fugue is wonderful today. What did you do? I mean, of course, I could not explain that to him because he was hard of hearing. <laughs> and uh, he was, uh, and you never pay attention. So if I said, oh, you know, I have my tape recorded, they said, yeah, okay, fine. You know, he didn't really care. He was happy that I actually did it. But that's what, that's what I did as a student. So I'm hoping that students these days would think a little bit for themselves and inventing things. Mm -hmm. Because those days... 
I don't think the teaching was as good as it is today. I mean, everywhere you go, I think the teaching has gone. It's uh, the quality of the teaching, generally speaking, is so much higher than 30 years ago. I think the teaching became so incredibly good. It's the students now that we want to take advantage of this good teaching. And in my day, I felt even with Mr. Galamian, we had to invent things ourselves. He mm-hmm. said something, and he was never that specific. That's one thing about He was specific in the sense of saying everything like in his book. Two, three, two, three things, and that's it. You mm-hmm. know, you couldn't really have an opportunity to discuss things with him because it was hard to communicate, you know. So, and then Galamir was the opposite. You'd say, don't you know there is a million ways to start that note and finish that note? I said, yes, okay, <laughs> I think I'm doing it. And then 10 years later, I figured out, oh, the poor man, I must have made him so upset because I, had, I, I didn't know anything. Even after winning international competition, I still mm-hmm. did not know anything. I didn't mm-hmm. know how to play a Beethoven sonata just the right way, the way you wanted. You know, finally I found out, but on my own, you know, took me about 10 years, but I found out by age 35, I, I thought I knew how to play everything just the way Columbia wanted. It's so important. You said it earlier, too, in the interview when you were talking about how you need the collaboration of the student in their own learning experience. And that's so true. I think that sometimes we um, we wait for the answers to come from outside when we really need to dig deeper inside and figure mm-hmm. it out for ourselves. So to see the teacher as a guide that shows us where to go, but we need to do the climbing ourselves. So it's very yeah, important. It's very say. important that we reassure things, but we expect at least some work from the student. Otherwise, if we see that the student either does not understand, then we teach it again. I, I'll do it as many times as necessary. <laughs> but once they understand, if they don't do it, then... The, the, it's almost goodbye, you know. I mean, why wasting time with people that don't really are trying hard enough? You know, they really have got to try. And if they cannot do it, and but you see that you can see, if I always tell my students, look, there are there is not such thing as right and wrong. You know, it would be great if you all played the right things. Then I will not have to waste my time or <laughs> spend time. But most of the time is we are going to be on the pad in between the one that you are doing everything to be right but it's not right there because you still need the time element for you to get into it you know but everything you are doing is the correct thing so you are using the right finger pant- patterns so that the, the the intonation is 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 better now if you don't follow those finger patterns you can practice 10 hours a day and it's not going to be in you know better in tune mm-hmm. so if they really do their work then it's a pleasure teaching even for people that are not necessarily terribly talented you know the ones that are very talented you don't you say two things two ta- twice and they do it and the ones that you have to say 10 times and it is better and better is the the where most students are it's the better mm-hmm. until it's perfect until it's really good so mm-hmm. but if there is no better then it is i think very uh, upsetting you know to teach you know you come <laughs> home at night and you are tired from people that are not doing their their work you know Mm -hmm. and if they have tremendous amount of difficulties and still not good but better then you feel good i'm never tired when i get home at night when i see that the students are doing their thing but if they aren't then it's not that you're tired you are depressed that uh, you know obviously what you're saying is not being done you know right yeah professor as always you always have the Great insight and so much knowledge. And I'm so grateful for everything I learned from you and very grateful that you're on the show today. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. It was a pleasure teaching you. And after the two years that we spent together, I thought, and when you came the third year, or I think it was the end of the third year to play, I remember the Strauss Sonata and uh, you mm-hmm. know that program. And the, it was such an incredible uh, progress. And um, the good part is, what we were talking today, you know, uh, you know, we listen and the recording, I'm sure it could be almost a recording, which is pr- precisely what we all want, you know, and yeah. I think it had the, 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 you know, the, the interpretation that you wanted to give it was exciting. And I remember when you first played for me, if I'm not mistaken, was the Sibelius Concerto. Yes. And you played the first page, and I said, how in the world can cannot René hear all these little details, right? Mm-hmm. And then we talked about that, and I think then it was wonderful progress. And uh, after listening, you know, you don't have to be a better violinist to play that well. All you have to do is to 
you know to be aware of of it and you know and then once your the awareness is there then right away the playing will be so much better absolutely you know, yeah. you know thank you so much you're welcome <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. I love studying with Professor Rubero and I learned so much from him. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation with him. You can find the show notes for this episode and more information about Mr. Rubero at mindoverfinger.com. And as always, I would love to connect with you and know what your favorite takeaway from today's show is. So please join the conversation on social media. Let me know what inspires you, what specific questions you have about mindful practice, and what other topics and guests you would like to hear about in future episodes. I am Mind Over Finger on all platforms. If you're looking for a community of mindful practice enthusiasts, join the Mind Over Finger tribe at facebook.com slash groups slash Mind Over Finger tribe. There you'll find inspiration, motivation, and support, as well as information and discussions on how to take your practice to the next level and enjoy the process. Next week, I have a great conversation with Joshua Roman for you. We talk about his Popper Etude project and challenge and about building a meaningful and fulfilling career. If you've enjoyed this episode, please take a minute to share it with a friend and head over to iTunes to rate and leave a review. If you get value out of this conversations, it's the best way to pay it forward and to help other people find out about the show. And while it is a passion project, and I'm loving every minute of it. It is a lot of hard work, so your kind words make it all worth it. A big thank you to my fabulous producer, Bella Kelly, and again, thank you for listening. A bientôt.